You're listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. You're listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. My name is Sean Wilkie, and along with my awesome co-host, we interview the innovators every week. Excited to talk to a friend from the industry today, Ivan, get us started. Hey, I'm, I'm Zach. I'm very excited about today's episode because we have a friend, an entrepreneur, and true innovator in the industry, Sebastian Gabor. Sebastian is a serial entrepreneur, educator, and a passionate believer in technology for the greater good. He is the co-founder of Digital, an all-in-one practice management software, and the first PIMS with AI capabilities, and that's not artificial in- uh, insemination. Uh, Sebastian believes in automation and empowering people with his strategic thinking and creative problem solving skills. Sebastian has made a significant impact in both veterinary and civic tech spheres, and I'm passionately using digital in all of our clinics. So Sebastian, welcome to the show. Excited to have you here. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. So uh, what is new? Uh, There's so much going on uh, and we're all trying to outpace the development of AI in the world and at least by knowing what the hell is going on. So what is new in digital that I have not seen in a release notes while using it? (laughs) Tell me. (laughs) Awesome. Well, since last time we spoke, I think the biggest change has definitely been the launch of Tails, which is the first native AI vet assistant directly in your practice management system. And initially, we launched this with a group of design partners, basically 10 forward-thinking hospitals that we worked together with them to learn where AI can be applicable today in, in hospital. And we, in a nutshell, we found out that definitely AI dictation, general assistant for medical support and productivity, and AI intake, so triaging patients and uh, doing the intake process are the three big uh, areas of opportunity where AI can have impact today. Um, and then at the end of 2023, we launched it officially, and we were amazed how it radically transforms the workflows in the practice. So end-to-end workflows, how they change. So if initially you were used to intake, writing notes, um, spending time to write the message for the pet parent at the end, now all of that changes. And we've just finalized a case study with a 5DVM practice where we found out that just in a week, they save over 15 hours of writing records, writing um, summaries, writing client education material, all of that. So that's just in a five vet practice. And we're also seeing a lot of innovators coming up in the space. And just to name one, uh, TrueVet, which they're building their entire hospital now based on AI workflows. So they're thinking on where to put microphones, how to change the rooms, how to do everything to support now and integrate more of the AI technologies in the day to day. I was waiting for someone to start doing that because this is something that I uh, was looking forward into incorporate. So in our clinics, I'm the uh, sort of avid user of the dictation and then transcription uh, through the AI and other four doctors are not despite me training them, showing them how to do it. So I think that the biggest problem that veteran, and this is funny because this is the the biggest problem that we're struggling with as a team to start using it at scale is someone turning the button on. (laughs) So I think that once we design the clinic around, maybe when you open the exam room door, it just turns on the microphone or something like that. I think that would be really cool because I'm glad that that's the problems we're dealing with today, but I can tell that the transcription, it's not transcription, it's really dictating into AI, capturing the sentiment, the medical records and everything truly changed my life. I mean, I actually like practicing vet medicine now because I hated it specifically for medical records. Um, And the other cool thing that, and you mentioned a couple of them because I want to ask you to unpack those features. What I do in Tails, I, the biggest feature that I find for Tails, and I, I think I'm underutilizing, that's why I honestly want to learn. Uh, the new one that actually your team showed to me is blood work. Uh, I used to take IDEX PDF and throw it in chat GPT. It's a different screen and then I'd copy paste. Now in Tails, the coolest thing is that it will take all existing medical record and then it will add everything that was pulled in from your lab if it's integrated. So we use IDEX equipment and it pulls it into the record and I just type in Tails analyze blood work, give me a summary and differentials. And boom, the whole thing is just written out, which is super impressive. Um, I can't wait until you incorporate signal pen into it so I can say, and also interpret the x-rays. Um, so what am I not using that's really cool you just mentioned? So dictation we're talking about, and then summary of blood work, what else people should be doing? Um, so on the on the general assistant part, uh, as you mentioned, again, putting getting the blood work, getting uh, summaries out of that, 
this goes even one step further. Like, for example, if you have long lists of soaps and histories, you can ask it to give you the entire uh, history in a couple of bullet points. Uh, and you'll get all of that uh, directly. And it's it spans across not only like blood work, history, communication. Um, also on this on this topic, if you have a lot of uh, two-way texting communication with a pet parent, you can ask to get you a client sentiment analysis. And it will detect out of the entire history, like if there was even one email where the client was a bit upset, it will flag that out so that you can know what happened and how to react. Then the other one would be definitely intake. So the intake is one of the, the next powerful uh, uh, use cases where for every pet parent that's booked in uh, three days in advance, they can start the intake process, which means that from the comfort of their home, together with their spouse, they can start, uh, they get questions from Tails and they can start answering those. And all those questions are curated based on the reason for the visit and on the patient history. So they won't ask the pet parent about vaccines if the vaccines are up to date. Uh, and it will go through through all the questions and also does triage. So it adapts in the conversation. It's not just the classical you know, forms like we had before where if yes, say, ask the next question, it actually pivots in any type of conversation. At the end, you get a summary and that summary goes directly to in the, in the, in the soaps. So this way you save time for everyone. Yeah, that's fascinating. It's, it's the, these features and functionalities, the, the rate at which, you know, open AI that everybody is kind of using their backend infrastructure is, is developing their core technology stack and the features that they're adding to it is it's almost hard to keep up with. Uh, actually, no, it's hard to keep up with. Um, where do you think, you know, this, these functions that you've added to your software, you know, take your customers in the future compared to people that aren't using this technology. And, um, you know, we do a lot of the same things now, and it's, it's really fascinating because there's a lot of the world that is not on this type of technology. And so the question that I have for you is, you know, if you're on an older PIMS that's, you know, not cloud-based, um, you know, what competitive advantages do you have as a veterinarian that is on a modern platform that's leveraging AI like Digital versus uh, somebody that's... This will be probably a really long answer, but I'll try to get a bit of the, the highlights. So if, if you're using now an old practice management system, most likely, and you're, you're, let's say you're one of the innovators and you're trying to use an AI tool, most likely what happens is that you'll go in ChatGPT or you'll go in the other tool, you'll copy paste information. What I like what Ivan was saying before is that you need to copy the blood work, put it in ChatGPT, get an answer, then bring it back. And the problem is that you won't get a really complete answer because you would need the blood work together with the history and the other information. So and there's no easy way on how you can copy that from any of the old practice management systems, which then creates a really clunky way of using it. So in in a nutshell, if you end up uh, switching to a new practice management system that has an in-depth um, built-in integration, you actually can start leveraging the entire set of, of AI technology. So uh, that was very concise. Um, and the, the interesting thing, as you guys are talking about this particular question, it's, it's interesting that I had, a, I had a use case, which was very interesting to see how the public reacts to it. So we sent, so SignalPen, uh, we just had Neil on, on our... Um, on our podcast. And I had a customer that came in and I sent an interpretation of radiograph to radiologist in signal pen and it returned. But then by mistake, we sent to a referring veterinarian, we're urgent care. So we send the record with the AI version of it. So we did have a radiologist interpretation and we charged them for it, but by mistake, we sent a wrong file and it took the file from signal pen about the just AI interpretation and the client uh reacted to it because referring dvm told them about this and said we paid 180 dollars for ai to interpret our x-rays and they were pissed about it and i'm just saying that i think we're going to be phasing out of this era very quickly way more way faster than we were before when everything is going to be done by ai and you would not have these comments even though we did the radiologist interpretation but the blood work, the assessment of the blood work, the machinery that, you know, IDEX uses, the records that we're taking, everything is going to be done by AI and it doesn't matter what you charge for it because that's the cost of it. So, you know, you, can, you wouldn't be able to even say that, well, this was done by AI, I dismiss it. Everything is done by AI. So I think that, and that I think that will be the paradigm shift actually in PIMS. Finally, I think we'll migrate from the old dinosaurs faster, not just because it's cloud, it's convenient and all other features, but actually AI. And it's exciting that you have a leading product that actually can do that. So what do you think 
is the rate of change and do you think that the rate of change from server-based to cloud-based with AI accelerated faster than it was before just between cloud and server? We have definitely seen an acceleration of, of adoption since uh, AI started, like since AI technologies have started to reach the market. I think the reason for that is that you can't leverage them with the old systems. Like the old systems make it really difficult to leverage them to the full capacity. And going back to, to also to Sean's question, the biggest, biggest challenge now is that if you're on one of the old systems, most likely all of the new players are not going to be able to provide you the experience that you need to be, in order to, to take advantage of them. And this is probably the, the biggest challenge of, of the VET space and what the PIMS landscape, even since we joined the, the space, is that it's so disconnected. Um, and 65% of the market is still using these old, old systems. And the more you spend time on them, the more you're missing out all the potential solutions that are coming out to the market day by day. And what this actually means is that other hospitals are now able to save significant time, provide better experience for the veterinary staff. They can actually make it home on time. They can be more relaxed. They don't need to worry about the, the soap they haven't finished uh, during, during office hours. And they don't need to worry that, what, did, the parent, did the pet parent actually give me the right information? All of that now happens in the background while you can focus on doing what you love. And this is the main advantage of how AI workflows are, are drastically changing now um, the experience in, in practice. Yeah, it's, it's interesting and funny, and I'm, I'm a believer, right? You know, we're we're doing a lot of the same stuff, and we help a lot of people that are on old systems because they don't want to move to new systems or because they're so deeply entrenched in the old systems. And you know, one of the one of the things that I've been talking about a lot lately, Sebastian, is just this kind of like history of documentation. We started like carving, you know, stuff into clay tablets and baking them in an oven, and that was how documentation started. And now we're speaking to AI, and you know, but people get stuck along the path, you know, of modernization. You know, I, I said to Ivan yesterday, there's, there's people that are on Avamark and they'll be on Avamark until they close their clinic. Same with Cornerstone, same with all of the other PIMs. Um, but the journey to kind of move people and change people's workflow, even if you can show them, you know, the, this incredible path to like not having to do documentation is challenging. And so how have you guys been overcoming some of those challenges of like moving people off systems that they've been on for 20 years since they started practice? And how do you motivate that change for for your users? And how does AI help? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. So for the last six years, we've been focusing on reducing the effort of, of change because change management is actually a real skill that you need to become really good at and to make that transition easy. And of course, if you've been a clinic that has been using Avimark or Cornerstone for the past 20 years and all the staff knows it, everyone knows it, it's really difficult to overnight start even imagining that you're going to change that uh, that system there. But Currently, the way, at least the way we do it, is that we give you a step-by-step -step approach um, from the moment you decide to switch to the moment you actually end up uh, finishing the, the change, a step-by-step -step approach in which you have full control over it. We make sure that everyone in the clinic gets trained. You make sure that all the data gets transferred from the old systems. Um, and then we make sure that by the end, the, the day you go live, everyone is ready to take advantage of the new technology. Um, and this makes it sound really easy, but... Again, it took six years to perfect the data migration process, making sure you have all the systems in the right place, um, and then also making sure that the people in the clinic go along with the change because the worst thing you want is you want to make the change, but everyone in the practice doesn't. But what we're also seeing now, and uh, maybe with this we can tap into um, into the study that we've done together with, with AHA, but we're seeing a lot of excitement from the veterinary staff members that actually want to use new, new tools. Think about it like you're using TikTok in your day-to-day -day life, but when you reach the office and the hospital, you need to use a clunky system since that has been built 20 years ago. It really doesn't, uh, it doesn't match, which makes it harder to hire the right people, hire the innovators, hire the people that actually want to take veterinary medicine to the next level. Um, and if you don't do this, then you get stuck in, in the past. And then you have all these new that you've seen, all the new clinics that are coming up, all the new workflows that will uh, will start uh, winning more uh, more of the market. Tell us more about this study that you did with uh, with uh, I think it was with Aha. Uh -huh, you guys did it together. Tell us about the article yeah. to give a quick note so we want to go and uh, read it. Yeah. So this uh, this happened a couple of months ago. So we uh, we started seeing that there were a lot of misconceptions around how to use AI in in vet med from again small things of uh, using AI for drug calculations. Uh, or not understanding that there's also error rates to 
uh, to AI. So what we started doing together with AHA, we asked a group of 4,000 veterinary professionals, so vet, vet techs, uh, CSR, so everyone working in, in practice, and we asked them questions around what do they think about AI, how would they use AI in practice. Ba- basically, the whole idea was to um, start shaping how we need to build AI today to actually take advantage of it. Because we're now in a moment where we have in our hands a really amazing technology that can shape the entire workflows, but there's also a chance we can get this wrong. So we wanted to get ahead of the curve and start shaping the technology with people from the that are in working in practice day by day. And I think the main takeaways are that 85% of the respondents actually are familiar with AI. And out of the total 4,000, close to 30% use it today daily or weekly in their practice. And we did some comparisons, and this adoption curve is similar to the adoption curve of computer programmers using new technologies. And it's definitely something you would expect from the vet space, because when you think about vet space and using new technologies, you would think that it's going to take 10 years until we actually end up adopting it. But it's actually, on the contrary, not the case. Yeah, it's so true. It's and one it, of the leading, yeah. It's so true. I mean, we've seen it. Like Q1, um, for, for our company, we've had the craziest growth that we've ever had in the history of our company. More people adopting our tools and signups and you know, just just all of a sudden, like Q4 versus Q1, it was like we were operating in a different world. Um, so I think that there is this... It's it's really fascinating because I think a lot of people in this industry, because it's a small industry, because um, we had uh, Ryan on the show from ScribeNote, and now we're here talking to you about it. A lot of people think that the pie is like a very limited pie, like there's only so much pie to go around. And I'm a believer in the infinite pie, you know, and I think that the more AI companies that come into veterinary medicine that help improve the lives of veterinarians that are here to do it for the right reasons, the better. And I don't think there's one solution that's right for everybody. I think there's a bunch of different solutions out there, but I think it's absolutely fascinating, the adoption curve and the interest. I I gave a talk at Western uh, Vet um, at WVC and, you know, on, on AI, and I walked into the room and there was 500 people there. I couldn't believe it. I was like, what is happening? So, and, and when me and Ivan were over in Portugal at the World Small Animal, it was the same thing. It was like full rooms, people from all over the world looking at this technology. And so I, I think that if there was an industry that needed some help, it's vet med. And I think it's really interesting that there's so many kind of innovators after solving the issue. What other things kind of blew your socks off with the survey, Sebastian? So a couple of other ones were that uh, in general, there's optimism, optimism when it comes to AI. Um, and what's interesting is that the most skeptical group segment was actually the youngest demographics. Uh, but this is really, it makes a lot of sense because whenever you have new technology coming into a space, you need that group of skeptics to shape the technology. Um, and this is also connected to when it, goes, when, it, when it came to fears or concerns, the top one was accuracy. So 70% were concerned about the accuracy of AI technology, and it makes a lot of sense, right? But despite that, you had that 38% of people that want to start using it. Because at the end of the day, you need to be aware that it's not going to you know, be 99% of the times right. But whenever it will give you a wrong answer, you're going to understand and you can refresh and, and get a new one. So it's about using the technology despite um, and knowing the risks of, of it. And another interesting point was that 35% were still concerned of costs. And you you also know it, but the cost of using AI technology now has ridic- like significantly reduced. And if anyone can start using this, like starting from $100 a month, you can now have access to, to any of the great tools that are out there and, and there are more to come. And I think another of the, of the concern was that 30% of the respondents were concerned about job loss and f- job replacement. So, and this is another thing where probably it goes back to, to your comment, Toronto, of like uh, competitiveness. But I really don't believe AI will replace anyone in the job market. But I truly believe that someone using an AI tool will definitely replace someone not using it. I agree with that. But I also think that AI will replace jobs very soon, a lot. So I think that this is the reality. And then this is will happen. And I think that if we're not staying current and understanding how to stay ahead of it, at least being on the forefront and using tools and then being more efficient in what you're doing right now, you somewhat have a job. But I think that those that don't think that it will work, skeptical, or don't even try to be current, I think we're going to lose the jobs that way. 
but we're out of time as usual. We can talk about this a lot. Damn it. I want to keep going. <laughs> but we are. So we always ask two questions, Sebastian. We could have you, you know, again and again here because there's so much to talk about. But uh, let's see if ChatGPT comes, uh, ChatGPT5 comes out and what's going to happen then. Sean and I will be replaced from this podcast by ChatGPT. <laughs> so, by deep takes. Yeah, they'll be better. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But two questions we always ask. Book, video, YouTube, recommendation from you to our listeners. Let's see. Book-wise, I would say one of the recent books that I've read that's, that's interesting is called How to Change from Katie Milkman. And it's about driving change through the power of identity-based behavior. So... And it, it explores all of the, the reasons why, you know, when New Year comes, why do you suddenly a lot of people in January start picking up and going to the gym and doing new behaviors? Uh, so it's all about like finding um, milestones in your life and repurposing, like rethinking of how you need to think about yourself, creating a new behavior, and that will lead you to adopting new habits. Really powerful book on, on changing, awesome. changing behavior. Love it. And then the last question is another innovator that you think we should invite to the show. I would say one person that um, was inspiring lately, especially when it comes to AI, would be Suvi Irvin, uh, who's a clinical development manager at Blue River Pet Care. And what was interesting is that she has the task to change the behavior in the entire organization and to adopt new technologies. Uh, and she's been doing a really great job at increasing adoption of, again, AI tools within a, within a huge uh, group. So really interesting conversation to, to have with her. Thank you so much for listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. If you want to hear about our new episodes, please follow us on any social media channel. Also, you can check out our website at veterinaryinnovationpodcast.com. See you next week.